Hello again, and welcome back to ELA Grade 6 for the week of June 8, 2020. All through this unit, you have read about decisions other young people have made and how it impacted their lives and the lives of others. In this lesson, you will read an article titled Adolescence and the Agony of Decision Making by Carl E. Pitchert, Ph.D. Then, you will determine if you agree or disagree with the author's position about the reason why it's hard for teenagers to make a decision. Think about it. When you need to make a decision about something, do you find it difficult or easy? In this article, the writer includes various maxims, or general truths, about decision making. Consider how the author uses these maxims to provide structure to the information he is providing about why some decisions are harder to make than others. As we read, we will annotate the text by underlining or highlighting information that illustrates why making decisions is difficult and how important decisions can affect a person's life. Consider the following questions while we read. Do you agree or disagree with the maxims included in this article, and why? What is the difference between indecision and ambivalence? What role do each of these traits play? and a person's ability to make a decision? And what conclusions does the author make about making choices? Why do you think the author includes these words of advice from Yogi Berra? When you come to a fork in the road, take it, to end the article. As I read, follow along and notice what I choose to highlight. You may wish to highlight additional information. And I'm going to get my highlighter ready to go here. Adolescence and the Agony of Decision Making. There are good reason why it's hard for adolescents to make up their minds. This was posted on March 4th of 2013 from Psychology Today. The question was, why is decision making so agonizing for our teenager? Why can't she just make up her mind and stick to what she's decided instead of going back and forth or looking for something else? The answer touches on the conflicted relationship between making choices and preserving freedom. So I'm going to highlight this. Conflicted relationships between making choices and preserving freedom. That has a lot to do with why it's hard to make decisions. You can't do the first without reducing the second because when you choose one course of action, a host of alternative courses become closed off. And for a young person at an age when more freedom to grow is most important, this human reality is very hard to accept. All decisions reduce more freedom than they create. And I would say that's a common truth or, as we learned, a maxim. It's why some young people prefer to be dreamers rather than doers. At least they can keep the world of possibilities open to them. By committing to choose nothing and keeping their options, however unlikely open, they feel freedom is still there for the taking. Or they may keep changing their minds and their direction to escape one set of choices for another, not sustaining any decision long enough to develop a clear trajectory in life. Dreams require commitment. No commitment. Dreams require no commitment, but decisions do. And I would say that is definitely a common truth. And up here, one of the reasons it's hard to make a decision, if they decide to choose nothing, they're keeping their options open. And there is nothing wrong with either of these alternative, only consequences. So it's okay, but there are consequences for each. Mostly what I see are young people wrestling with two demons of decision-making, indecision and ambivalence. 
Ambivalence is the state of having mixed feelings about something or someone. Overlapping issues, but slightly different. To illustrate the difficulty of decision making during adolescence, here are two examples, both from high school. Start with indecision over a hard choice. A high school junior really enjoys female company, as his extensive record of dating amply shows. Now he has met a female classmate who he likes more than any young woman he has known, and he doesn't want to lose her special liking of him to some other guy. He thinks she would be willing to date him exclusively if he was willing to do the same for her. Then there is the problem of ambivalence that is embedded in the process of growing up. So ambivalence is another problem in growing up. Here, the example concerns another high school junior who has been an outstanding athlete since the beginning of middle school and has loved her dad's attention, enthusiasm, and support of her sports. Now she finds herself facing a very painful decision. It's not like I'm so good I have a great future in athletics. I don't. It's been a lot of fun, but now I'm ready to move on to something different in my life. Maybe get a part-time job after school with all the hours I used to spend at practice so I can make some spending and saving money. So what's the problem, I ask? That's when she looks sad. It's my dad. He loves sports, and that's been his major interest in me. Give them up, and I lose a lot of his attention. But since last year, I've known that I was doing sports mostly for him and us. I want to keep him in my life. I don't want him to drop out. Now she is locked in a very painful ambivalence. Remember we said ambivalence was having mixed feelings about something or someone. So she's having a very painful ambivalence about pleasing herself and pleasing her dad. And she can't do both. She can't claim new freedom of individuality and independence without sacrificing some of their old connections. Growing up is giving up, having to give up some things. Another maxim. So what might you say to your adolescent about why decision making can be so difficult? Consider explaining something like this. Life is a one-way trip that's partly charted by those choices that we make and those we decide not to make. We can't go back and do them over. Choices cannot be unmade. They're there. It's done. As we proceed, we can always change our mind, changing our present and even our future, but never changing our past. We must build on the history of what we have and haven't done. Now it's your turn to annotate on your own. I will continue to read to the end of the article. Go ahead and annotate, highlight, underline, circle. Look for information that shows why decision making is difficult. And we must accept three limitations on decision making. First, free choice is never free because all choices come with consequences that set our course through life. Second, there's only one life given to a customer and it doesn't last forever. Choosing decides how we spend our lifetime. Third, there's no guarantee our choices will get what we want. All choices create the risk of unpredictable consequences. Choosing is a gamble, and it's our life we're gambling with. As for hard decisions, they offer costs and payoffs either way we choose. That's why they're difficult. Choosing is a compromise. We can't get what we want without also giving up some of what we want and getting some of what we don't want. So, to respect this mix, we must take time to think both aspects out. What not to do is letting reluctance to make a hard decision result in letting an important choice point pass, and later looking back on that loss of opportunity with regret. Probably, for the best, is following the advice of that old baseball guru, Yogi Berra. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. I hope you've noticed how the author provides reasons that decision making is difficult and then supports them with maxims or 
as we learn general truths. It's a good way of structuring the article. And now please turn to the show what you know in your packet. And you are ready to finish up the lesson. Refer to the annotations made in the article. Do you agree or disagree with the author's position on why it is difficult for teenagers to make a decision? And explain your thinking. Next, you will make a claim statement and support it with evidence from the article. Once you've completed this, you are done with this lesson. Yay! And that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the article. I thought it was interesting myself. So be safe, be well, and have a great week. Thanks for participating. Bye-bye. Hello, welcome back to ELA Grade 6 GT for the week of June the 8th, 2020. In this lesson, you will choose a piece of Shakespearean text and plan a pitch for a modern staging of the scene. So just what is a pitch? A pitch is an argument about why someone should agree to a project or a product. You may have heard of the term sales pitch, where someone is trying to convince others to purchase a product. Sometimes writers develop pitches for their potential books. Sometimes directors or producers develop pitches for their potential movies, plays, or television series. Think about what might help convince a production company to agree to a particular product. You may recall that literature develops themes in ways that we can describe in theme statements. Complex texts such as Shakespeare usually deal with more than one theme. Themes are universal ideas and concepts. It's a theme that can be one word or phrase. And it's what the text is about, the big idea, a universal idea that appears in most cultures and throughout human experience. For example, ambition would be a theme. And then we also go from theme to making a theme statement, which is a statement of what the text says about the universal idea or concept. It's the text's central message, and it's in one sentence. It's a universal truth that we can see in most cultures, and again, throughout human experience. For example, a theme statement for ambition could be, ambition can corrupt and bring about the downfall of a person. Here are some more examples of theme in Shakespeare and other literature. Relationships and love. Revenge and power, ambition and duty, time, loyalty, and art and the cycle of life. Which feel relevant to you? As you prepare to review the Shakespearean text in your packet, let's gain a deeper understanding of Shakespeare's relevancy today by viewing a short video from Discovery Education titled, Performing Shakespeare on Stage. This video will help us to understand how Shakespeare uses universal themes that make his works truly relevant today. Remember, Shakespeare's writings are from over 400 years ago. Notice how the actor in the video feels about the importance and relevance of Shakespeare today. One of our finest actors, Ian McKellen, has spent a lifetime performing in Shakespeare's plays. If somebody invites you to uh, read a bit of Shakespeare and understand why so many people like me are crazy about Shakespeare and think he's the greatest writer who ever lived and provided us, provide us with so much entertainment. Uh, it's almost as silly as uh, me writing down all the moves in a football match and saying, enjoy that. You can't. You have to see it, don't you? Same as Shakespeare, really. You have to see it in the theatre. But is it difficult playing Shakespeare's roles. People say, oh, how do you learn all those lines? Well, because the lines aren't just lines. 
the words uh, express emotions. So what you're learning when you learn the words is learning how you're feeling. Words is only part of it. Many of his plays are written in, uh, in verse, just as all pop songs are written in verse. They have rhymes, they have rhythm. Uh, same with uh, Shakespeare. But the rhythm it doesn't mean to say that it sounds odd. It doesn't. Uh, uh, if music be the food of love, play on. That's written in rhythm. De dum de dum de dum de dum de dum. If music be the food of love, play on. Even the most famous line of Shakespeare, to be or not to be, that is the question, is uh, again the same rhythm. So uh, that is a device that Shakespeare uses, I think, in part to help the actors learn the lines, because it's easy to learn the lines if there's a rhyme at the end, maybe, or if there's that uh, uh, rhythm. Although the plays are 400 years old, they go on being uh, more than relevant, they go on being entertaining and illuminating. Uh, and for me, that's what makes Shakespeare uh, the best writer of them all. Ian's been closely involved in a new app to make Shakespeare more accessible. This is a way of you reading Shakespeare, but with the help of people who've studied the plays and acted in them, and they are the actors. So in our app, you can see the words of Shakespeare, which will move up, uh, and across the top will be the actors speaking the words as, as you're following them here. Now does my project gather to a head? My charms crack not. My spirit so you hear the words out loud, and in hearing them, it's easier, much easier, than reading them on your own. And you're in the company of me and Derek Jacobi and other actors who uh, know a lot about Shakespeare and love Shakespeare, and they'll, they'll be able to convey to you the meaning of the words much, 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 uh, in a much simpler way than you could ever do it on your own. Shakespeare's work tells us so much about life in the early 1600s. In the birthplace garden, there's a war book which Dr. Nick Walton helped to create. Well, already I can see here, it looks like it's got everything, all the life sort of passes on these pictures. It is. Well, you've got all Shakespeare's 38 plays, all pictured in the Globe Theatre where they'd have been performed. And there's some weird and wonderful things that happen in the plays, but also some very familiar things. So in Henry VIII and in The Winter's Tale, you'll find babies being born. In The Merry Wives of Windsor, you'll find children going off to school. And then you've got things like kings being crowned. You've got soldiers going off to war. And you can see there's a lot of blood on the war chart. So Sam Sadly, there's some very yeah, bloody deaths could, as well. Just right there, there's a, a leg and no body. That's right, know? really horrible things. It was a violent place to be in Shakespeare's London at the time. Do you think that's why his place was so popular? Because he really sort of connected with everyday life? He knew what it was like to be us. He knew what it was like to feel the wonderful things that we feel, and he found the most amazing language and poetry to express that in. But he also knew some of the terrible things that we feel and some of the awful things that people can do to one another. He shows you those, and he makes you ask why. I always think Shakespeare leaves you at the end of his plays, walking away from his theater, saying, would I have behaved like those characters? Do I think it was right what they did? He wants people to talk. He wants people to have a conversation. And he wants them to come back to his theater to watch another play. So I think Shakespeare's plays always make you think. Hopefully, you were able to pick up on the relevancy of Shakespeare in modern times, and especially today. And that's what you're going to be doing as you move into reading and reviewing the Shakespearean monologue, soliloquies, and sonnet in your packet. Look for common themes that you think are relevant today. Choose one piece of text you would like to focus on for your pitch to a modern audience. Note the figurative and connotative language of Shakespeare's word choice. Annotate the figurative language as well as the wordplay he uses, and jot the themes and theme statements in the margins. You do know how to annotate. Now let's turn to the show what you know in your packet. 
you are ready to plan your pitch by completing the planning chart that will guide you toward creating a compelling pitch. You may also use your own organizer for planning. You will write your pitch and using your notes and your planner in the next lesson. So go ahead, review and choose a piece of text and then complete an organizer on your own. So that's it for today. Thank you for coming and have a great week. Be well and be safe. Bye-bye.